Welcome to Dr. Osborne's Zone. Today we're going to be talking about one of the most important B vitamins and often overlooked B vitamins. It plays such an integral role in health and it's easy to become deficient in. So let's dive in to vitamin B1. Now, there's a lot of different types of symptoms that can happen as a result of vitamin B1 deficiency. And the vast majority of what we're seeing here, the fatigue, muscle pain, anxiety, neuropathy, blood pressure, brain fog, depression, increased heart rate, are caused because of the role that this vitamin plays in producing a chemical compound called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is the primary chemical involved in the parasympathetic nervous system. So, parasympathetic nervous system is the part of our nervous system that helps us to relax, digest, sleep, versus the sympathetic on the other end of the equation, the sympathetic nervous system is all about fight or flight. And acetylcholine, which is, you can't make it without vitamin B1, acetylcholine deficiency will turn down the parasympathetic nervous system's activation. So your ability to relax, digest, and sleep is gonna be greatly hindered, and your sympathetic nervous system is gonna predominantly take over. And so this is gonna drive things up. Fight or flight is gonna put you ramped up in a state where all of these different types of symptoms can occur. Again, fatigue, and so we get into chronic fight or flight, we get adrenal fatigue, right? We get muscle pain because you also need acetylcholine to, to talk for your nerves to talk to your muscles. You get anxiety because you're in a chronic state of fight or flight. You get neuropathy because acetylcholine is a primary neurotransmitter for um, for nerves to be able to communicate with each other. You can get high blood pressure because you're ramped up and brain fog because you can't think clearly and depression and increased heart rate. Again, so this really very, very critical biochemical process of the production of this acetylcholine becomes very important. And so vitamin B1 plus choline generally helps us make acetylcholine and actually vitamin B5 is very important in the production of this too. Vitamin B1 and vitamin B5 are important for the acetyl aspect of acetylcholine. So you've got, again, these are three B vitamins, but today we're talking about vitamin B1 playing that major role. And so where people get into trouble is when they get into a state of sympathetic dominance. Now muscle pain can occur and one of the biggest reasons, again, why, why we get muscle pain is the nerve communicates so this is the nerve body the end of the nerve there are these synapses and so the way that nerve communicates is through that that acetylcholine And so what ends up happening is the communication from the central nervous system and, and from your voluntary control can't communicate to the muscle very well and vice versa. We, we run out of that neurotransmitter to fill that synapse. And so there's a discommunication and that can lead to and contribute to a lot of muscle fatigue, which translates oftentimes into muscle pain. We also have the neuropathy aspect, and for the same reason, neuropathy, there's a disease state of vitamin B1 deficiency called beriberi. If you've not heard of this, beriberi is, is a frank overt deficiency, a severe deficiency of vitamin B1, and it causes, there's two kinds of beriberi, there's a dry form and there's a wet form of beriberi. And the dry form of beriberi is what leads to the neuropathy. And, and it's not just neuropathy. So, so when I say neuropathy, it's numbness and tingling of the hands and feet, electrical sensations down the legs or up the legs. But we can also get neuropathy in the mind. And, and so some of the other symptoms associated uh, that we're talking about today, for example, we'll, we'll skip this one here for a minute. 
Uh, depression, again, neuropathy of the mind, depression, depressed ability for the nerves to communicate to one another through that lack of acetylcholine, and then also as well anxiety because uh, your body, instead of using acetylcholine to communicate, is using adrenaline and noradrenaline, and then we can also get fatigue as part of that as well. But um, let's get to that last one, brain fog. This is where I was aiming. So brain fog being a very, very hallmark symptom of vitamin B1 deficiency subclinically. So if we're talking about before major disease sets in, Vitamin B1 deficiency will cause a lot of brain fog. Again, going back to acetylcholine, I sound like a broken record, but that chemical is so crucial and so important and you can't make it without vi vitamin B1. And because vitamin B1, aside from that, is also important in the production of ATP, which is equal to energy. And so your body is in its ability to generate energy. And if you think of ATP, ATP to your body is a lot like money is to you in the real world. You, you can't pay rent, you can't buy gas, you can't buy food, you can't buy clothing or shelter without money in the real world. Well, your body can't do the things that it needs to do without that ATP energy. And vitamin B1, as are all the B vitamins, but, but vitamin B1 is very important in the ability to make that ATP energy. So not only do we have a chemical that we can, if we don't have, we can't generate the energy necessary to perform cellular functions, but we also can't generate the neurotransmitter that allows the nervous system to properly communicate all of its messages. Because if you think about it, you've got the brain and the spinal cord that send nerve, nerves in, all out to the different tissues of your body, the organs, uh, you know, the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments, the organs themselves, all of those things are fed by nerves and they send messages back through the nerves. And so that two-way communication or that two-way highway, which is largely dependent on acetylcholine, but for everything else to work, you've also got to have the ATP or the energy. And so that's where a lot of the symptoms of vitamin B1 deficiency set in. And so going back to you know, some of these other symptoms that we skipped, high blood pressure, we know vitamin B1, this is part of we refer to it as wet berry berry. So this is how vitamin B1 deficiency affects the heart. It can actually lead to congestive heart failure, uh, which is you know leads to fluid retention in the lower extremity, and that in and of itself can start pushing blood pressure. We also know that uh, the heart, as a pump, won't function as efficiently without vitamin B1. We know fatigue, and this is going back to what I said a minute ago about ATP. You cannot break your carb, fat, and protein. You cannot convert those foods into energy, into ATP, without vitamin B1. So you can get energetic fatigue, but you can also get neurological fatigue as a result of lack of acetylcholine. And then anxiety, and so this is really Acetylcholine. I see this a lot in people where they're super anxious, they have a hard time going to sleep at night, their mind won't shut off. When they do sleep, it's very restless sleep. And vitamin B1 plus choline plus magnesium is, is a trifecta that can really be helpful if you struggle here. And, uh, and you've not been able to get any kind of relief in any other way. Okay, let's move back forward through these slides. I wanna talk more about the aspects of vitamin B1 and how it, you can become deficient in it. So if we look here in this study, and this is a research review, and you can see here that um, um, Vitamin B1 is, is susceptible to degradation. It has a very short half-life in the body and in, it can be depleted by a number of products that epitomize modern life. In other words, a lot of the things that you do, a lot of the things that you enjoy can contribute to vitamin B1 deficiency, including environmental and pharmaceutical chemicals. The RDA for thiamine is, is, is a meager 1.1 to 1.2 milligrams for adult females and males respectively with an average diet even a poor one, it is not difficult to meet that daily requirement, and yet measurable thiamine deficiency has been observed across multiple patient populations with incidence ranging from 20 to 
percent, and I see this extremely commonly in my practice. Now the study suggests that an RDA requirement may be insufficient, and I think that's really important. You know, one of the ironies that I hear on a regular basis from people, hey, Dr. Osborne, you think that that, that vitamin B1 is too high? You think that dose could be too high and hurt me? But I don't see the same concern when they've got a list of 12 different medications that are interacting with each other. It's like they're concerned over a natural B vitamin at, at levels above the RDA, but not concerned about polypharmacy multiplying and, and, and mixing massive quantities of medications. But uh, again, the RDA requirement, what is that? Where did that come from? I think it's important that you understand that the RDA came from, the recommended daily allowance, came from research studies where just enough of the vitamin was given to prevent full-blown disease. So we're talking in, in the case of vitamin B1, berry, berry. How much does a person need of vitamin B1 daily in order to not have overt berry, berry, right? Which manifests as severe neurological disease, including diseases like seizures and manifest as congestive heart failure, high blood pressure, and, and um, cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. So only 1.1 to 1.2 milligrams a day to prevent full-blown disease. But what about optimal levels? So there's, there's disease on one end of the spectrum, and then there's great health on the other end of the spectrum, right? And it's the RDA is right here, 1.1, right? But what do you need to get here? And that answer is different for different people. It's not, it's, there's not one number. It's not 50 milligrams. Uh, it's not 100 milligrams for everybody. But it depends on the individual and it depends on a variety of different factors, which we'll dive into here in just a, just a moment. But I just want you to understand that the RDA was set to prevent overt disease. We want great health not just the absence of overt beriberi. So all that being said, you see here this suggests the RDA, the requirement may be insufficient to meet the demands of modern living and as much as thiamine deficiency syndromes pose great risk of chronic morbidity. We come over here, an extension of this study. I wanted to point out high carbohydrate diets effectively decrease circulating thiamine concentrations. Again, thiamine is vitamin B1 by a number of mechanisms. Metabolizing carbohydrates, regardless of their source of quality, diminishes thiamine stores. Remember, for every carb, gram of carb that you consume, that gram of carbohydrate, to break it down biochemically, requires vitamin B1. So if you're eating empty carbs, carbs that come without vitamins, like a soda, or alcohol, right? These are the obvious ones. Those things are, are going to provide a, a theft of vitamin B1 from your internal stores in order to process those carbs. Metabolizing carbs, regardless of their source or quality, diminishes thiamine stores. One study found that when 55% of total calorie intake came from carbs, no matter what their source was, thiamine status in otherwise healthy and thiamine sufficient individuals declined. 